the only shooting stick with one-handed trigger pull adjustments, has a new way to keep you at the top of your game. The Trigger Stick Apex, built for sturdy support that adapts to unforgiving terrain with easy adjustments to make your big shots. With our Durasteady three-piece carbon leg design and interchangeable rock-solid clamp, nothing tops the Apex. The Trigger Stick Apex, only from Primrose. Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. Thank you for tuning in, for downloading, for subscribing, for all of those other things that you do to listen to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. And an extra special thank you to all those who are leaving reviews and ratings on iTunes. They come in spurts, but when they come, it's really cool to see that feedback. Also to have those little stars that help get this podcast in front of more fingers and thumbs on devices, which turns into more downloads and consequently gets it in front of more people, which is really what the whole purpose of me doing this is, to share what I enjoy sharing with you. So today we're going to talk about something a little bit more derivative than just going out and going fishing, but hopefully you can see how they fit together. Now, plenty of times on the podcast before, I've talked about my appreciation for the history of fly fishing and how if you fish in the United States, you don't have to go too far to really get plugged into people that were fishing in those very same spaces or in very similar manners than to the way that you are enjoying fly fishing today, particularly if you live in certain places. If you live in uh, upstate New York, if you live um, in south, south central Pennsylvania, um, if you live uh, in, in the Rocky Mountains outside of Denver. I mean, even though that's a relatively recent timeline, there's so much stuff that has happened in these areas um, over the past century, century and a half that have been pivotal and integral to not just fly fishing in the United States, but because of just the, the, the course of history that have then been exported throughout the world, whether that be gear, whether it be technique, whether it be art, literature, all those things, uh, there's been so much influence that has come from people that have walked in the very same banks that you have. And there's actually, in my opinion, there's not just kind of joy that comes from that, from learning these things and, and getting to know about them more, but it can actually make your angling better. And, and I have a quick story about that. So um, there was a creek that I had been reading about for, for years um, I was was reading about this creek, reading about uh, how it was it was so famous back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and here I was as a teenager in the 90s reading about it, thinking, oh, this sounds like a really cool place. I'd love to go there. I've, I've fished around it, but I've never fished it before, and I just kind of absorbed all this information to the point where in my mind I was constructing kind of a a, a mental inventory of each pool each riffle, each rock, each parking lot, each overhanging branch. However, that was like 30 or 40 years in the past. And it was really neat because uh, I eventually got there and things hadn't changed that much. So get on the, the creek and I start fishing. And I'm walking and I'm thinking, okay, this was supposed to be here. And there used to be a bridge there, but now there's just bridge abutments. But you know what? I bet there's still a at, at least some sort of undercut or some sort of deep pool there. And sure enough, there was still a deep pool there. It wasn't because there was a bridge and the kind of fish that held under the bridge were no longer holding there anymore because there, obviously there was no, no cover for them, but there was still the remnants of it. And so seeing that did translate into being able to fish a little, little bit um, more in tune with what was going on. And as I worked my way upstream, I, I was reading about how this used to be a fork. There's a, a fork in the stream, but now there's nothing. I mean, it just dog to the right. 
I'm thinking like, you know, no, it said right before this road and the road hadn't moved in, 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 you know, since the road had been built, it was very, very clear because in a relatively steep grade. So the water kind of tumbling down from the right, with the road and the bridge going over it, I thought, where in the world is this little feeder Creek? And as I walked up, I realized it's, it was still there. It was just small. It had been uh, impounded and impeded through various uh, agricultural uh, uses over over the, the decades, and it was still there. But I was looking for it. Now, inevitably, if I would have walked up that, that um, bank, I would have stepped into this cold water that was coming in even through these deep, deep weeds, but I was looking for it, and it was really neat to make that connection and say, okay, it looks incredibly different than it did in the 1950s. There's no question about that, but it's still there. And at the bare minimum, this cold water influence is something that if, if I was just fishing upstream, now I know this is a place where maybe fish would hold. But more than that, I knew that this, this little feeder branch was a viable fishery in its own right. And a lot of people had written about that over the years. And so what did I do? I waded through this marshy, you know, knee high uh, brush, uh, neck high cattails until it finally opened up and it was a creek that there was no other footprints there was hoof prints everywhere but nary a boot print from another angler to be found and again might i have found that like i would found so many other little nooks and crannies in streams and rivers from just exploring of course and other people would have too but because of reading these books i was looking for it and I found it. And it was uh, really exciting because I got into fish, first of all. But secondly, it was just a neat connection to the anglers that had come before me. So um, that's kind of the, the, the anecdotal side of, of all of this. Um, I would say a, a similar story um, was looking for historical remains alongside of a, of a mountain creek in Pennsylvania that I that I had fished kind of the, the lower, warmer stretches, but then I read about some old uh, um, ironworks and some old um, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, programs and projects that had happened upstream, and the, it didn't change the fishing, but just reading about that, getting a sense of place, getting an understanding of kind of what was going around was, was really neat. So did they have anything with angling? Nothing whatsoever. But you can see how, if you're into history, if you are into kind of what came before you, uh, there, there might be some connection to what's going on in the water. But there's a few things I want to talk about. I've already talked about a couple of anecdotes, but a couple of like particular reasons why you could, and in my opinion, should pay a little bit of attention to uh, your, your angling ancestors. The first one is education. It is always valuable, always valuable, whether good, bad, or otherwise, to know the who, what, when, where, why of a subject that you're invested in. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, to be able to articulate fly fishing is to know fly fishing. Um, so if, if you want to understand fly tying better, if you want to understand fly casting better, if you want to understand reading the water better, try to articulate that. Try to use words. And sometimes you can steal words. Steal my words. I mean, there's a difference between, you know, plagiarizing, like putting it onto a, a, a podcast or a blog or something like that, and explaining it to your friend on the river. You don't even have to give me credit. But if you do, make sure they leave a five-star uh, rating on iTunes. Um, but if you can, if you know that who, what, when, where, why, and how of a subject, then you, there's a good chance that you can articulate that. Um, so who were the pivotal fly fishing figures in early conservation? Uh, what led the industry to go from glass to graphite and back to, to glass again? Um, why did stocking become standard practice on a local river? Uh, by knowing those things, you have a better grasp of kind of why you're doing what you're doing. It can only be helpful. So really the great way to start with this is asking a question. And this is something that's a lot easier to do now with the, with, you know, the ability to say, Hey Siri, and uh, her, her ears just picked, perked up as I said that with my phone line here next to me, to be able to say that and ask that question. Now, there are certainly some much better resources online than others, but what they can also do is they can lead you to that wonderful thing called a library, and you can pick up a book or you can purchase that book, and now you have it in your own personal library, and you're able to find out more about your local watersheds, or you're able to find out more about topics that might interest you. So just general education. Secondly, conservation. This is huge. 
the past half century is kind of like a uh, a perfect example of hits and misses, uh, successes and failures of conservation. So you don't have to look very long or hard to find longitudinal studies regarding the impacts of stocking fish in a watershed that has a species that occupies the same niche. So, you know, brown trout going over top of brook trout. There are studies all over the place that talk about that. So you might protest, say, oh, why are we stocking fish here? And the people that might give you a good answer probably have data to back that up. And the people having a bad answer might not. And for you to be able to speak authoritatively on that, you're able to, again, with a click of a mouse, with a, with a, an easy search at the library, get information about that. Similarly, even just prioritization. So if you're involved with a local trout unlimited chapter, for example, or some other watershed conservation organization, or if you simply like to play, uh, you know, armchair conservationist from your, your laptop, be informed. There is so much information on there on the prioritization of certain conservation projects over others. What things have really been much to do about nothing and which things have actually been impactful. Uh, how to mitigate stream channelization. How to reintroduce uh, native species that can aid to in riparian buffers. Um, how to uh, encourage the uh, flourishing of other aquatic species that aren't fish, but that aid and and uh, help fish come back in greater numbers and greater strengths and in, in healthier uh, biomasses. So little things like that, which you know, you might say, well, what's the point of that? Well, again, if you are part of this one of these conservation organizations, or if you 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 know, if you whine about climate change online, but you, you are unable to articulate what you can do with your boots in the water in your local stream, I would say that's an inconsistency. I'm all for somebody trying to make big picture change and talking about big picture change if they're able to make small picture change. Uh, if they're able to talk about, you know, why are we switching out culverts to uh, to to alternative uh, drainage systems in a, a local watershed. Those kind of things matter and they actually help and they make a noticeable difference. So you're able to learn from the mistakes and you're able to learn from the successes from what's been happening just again in your local area, but certainly in the United States and across the world over the past 40 or 50 years. You don't want to make the same mistakes. You don't want to spin your wheels. You know, you don't want to uh, uh, tear out a dam just because, oh, we tear out dams. That's what we do. Think about the, the downstream effects. And there's lots of information out there and people that have put, you know, their failures on paper for your benefit. So first reason to be kind of an amateur fly fishing historian is education. Secondly is conservation. Thirdly is entertainment. Now, there is no shortage of value in being entertained with old fly fishing books. They might not be talking about the latest and greatest equipment. They might not be talking about the latest and greatest uh, tactics and techniques. But the reality is, it's really all very derivative of, of all of it. You know, uh, the, the new ground that we are uh, forging in fly fishing is simply the refining of things that have been tried and true for hundreds, if not thousands of years when it comes to catching fish. So, you know, think about it kind of like a, um, like a, a family tree diverging. Somebody made some decision on how to nymph 50 years ago, 60 years ago that, that took off like wildfire. Uh, someone decided to tie uh, hackled flies in a certain way a couple hundred years ago. There was other people doing similar things in that same time that maybe didn't have the same pop. Maybe Orvis didn't put it in their original catalog. Maybe herders didn't advertise it, or it wasn't something that was being done by the uh, fancy schmancy guides at the popular Catskills resorts in the, the end of the 19th century. But go back to that time and see what flies were being tied. See what other people were doing, and maybe take something and, and forge your own trail using a lot of those uh, preliminary foundational works that were done. It, the end result might not be drastically different than what you are already doing. It's not going, again, it's not going to revolutionize fly fishing. They're not going to put the cork up at the tip of the rod and they're, they're, you know, you're not going to be uh, making the hook face the opposite direction or anything like that, but you're going to be able to get new ideas. And it's also going to be fun to see. It is so incredibly 
uh, you know, hilarious to see uh, the just the, the the fashion trends and the gear trends and the trends in literature and how we really haven't changed that much. But it's also a great thing to do. This sounds silly to say as this is being recorded in the middle of August, but we're a couple months away from things being frozen solid here in New England. It's a great way to stay connected and to be entertained by what is is out there in the fly fishing literature. Okay, so how do you do it? How do you do it? All right, three things. Now, I've been saying fly fishing literature, and, and that's just because that's really my bent. Uh, that's my, my walls have fly fishing art all over them, but it's mostly contemporary and, and newish stuff. But my bookshelves, my bookshelves are filled with old fly fishing books or with contemporary books that deal with historical topics. Um, it, it's so easy to go to a used bookstore uh, and find you know, a classic fly fishing book. Or what's, what's even easier is to go on to your Kindle or something like that and pull something up. Now, I am not a huge fan of reading on a tablet or a device, but if, if that's the only way you can do it, if you can do it while you're on the train, if you can do it in those five minutes you get alone to, your, to yourself um, in the middle of the day and you want to read on that, then that's great. But it's really neat to not only read an old book, but have a book that is old. Um, you know, you can read Isaac Walton, you can de- read Dame Juliana, but you can also, you know, read people that are, even, again, even just 50, 50 years old. And there's going to be some fantastic information in there. Um, almost everything is in print. Every once in a while you find something that's referenced that's a little hard to get a hold of, but there is some great resources online for tracking down old books in general and old sporting books in particular that are definitely worth looking at. And you can find books that maybe somebody wrote something very, very small and had it published by a local publishing house in your local waters. I'm so surprised at my local library that the volume of, of, of fishing and hunting uh, and outdoors literature that was produced just right around where I live. And the same thing was true in the last few few states I've lived in. Uh, when I lived in South Central Pennsylvania, my goodness, the fly fishing section was just, you know, stack after stack in the library. And so if you live in a place where there's been fishing and there's been an outdoors lifestyle, uh, definitely check it out. And don't limit yourself to just fly fishing. Find people who are general outdoor writers. Find people that are fishing with conventional tackle because there wasn't as strong of a delineation about, you know, us versus them, fly fishing versus conventional tackle, you know, 50, 60, 70, Five years ago, it was like, what's the most convenient way to do it, or what's just our preference? But we're ready to catch fish however and wherever we want. So, books are your first thing. Um, real quick, a little bit of a, a plug on uh, the website, castingacross.com. There is a whole section of fly fishing books, and I haven't broken them down into kind of genre and style. And if you click on those links, it will give you a couple things. It'll give you a little thumbnail of the book cover, uh, and then it'll give you my like one paragraph review. And then I'll give you a link to go buy. I'm trying to switch all those links over from the big online box stores to the individual publishers or authors so that you can support them directly. Um, Again, I'm in the process of doing that. But if you have any questions about those books, because I only do give like a paragraph, real quick snippet uh, synopsis of my thoughts, uh, you can always reach out. Matthew at castingacross.com. I'm happy to give you uh, a fuller book review um, just through email or even a phone conversation uh, if you see something that I've written about just in brief. Secondly is museums. Have you ever been to a fly fishing museum? There's a lot of them. Um, there's one in Manchester, Vermont. That's the American Museum of Fly Fishing. Uh, there's one in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, which is the Pennsylvania Museum of Fly Fishing. There's one in Livingston, Montana. There's one outside of Asheville, I believe. Um, there's one in the Catskills. Uh, I think it's in Roscoe. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. Um, and just small um, intimate little venues that usually have a lot of other things going on besides just exhibits, whether it be hosting spaces for conservation organizations or having classes or things like that. Um, but they're all, almost all of them are situated on the banks of good trout rivers. So this is something that you can incorporate. If you're going on a destination trip, you might be able to work in a stop at a fly fishing museum. And again, that might be the beginning of your journey, learning about a person, learning about a place, learning about a thing. Realize that, uh, you know, that that reel that you have sitting up in a shadow box in your office is the exact same one used by some president that uh, when he was, was catching fish. All sorts of neat things you can find there. And, and the people that are there, I mean, they live and breathe fly fishing. So they're happy to talk with you if you have even the slightest inclination to be interested in the historical nature of fly fishing. So uh, books, 
museums, and thirdly is people. All right, people can be a great resource. And before there were books, before there were countless fly fishing periodicals and an exponentially more uh, greater amount of fly fishing blogs, there were conversations at the fly shop. There's the the woman who's been involved in the Trout Unlimited chapter for since its inception, wherever wherever you you are. Um, make a point to hang out and ask the old timers in the parking lot of the uh, of the the stream parking or you know by the at the the local pub next to the the river. Ask them questions. Be thoughtful. Have them tell stories. You know that's not something that we do as much as we used to, and I think that we're we're losing something because of that. Um, as great as books, as great as museums, as great as all the things are, the truth is that many of the authors and the exhibits are still kind of fishing in your rivers today. Um, some of the pioneers of contemporary fly fishing uh, are are still active and at it, and we we are losing them um, just just as the nature of life. But a lot of them are still very, very active. A lot of them still are, are making the, the tour with the, the fly fishing show as it moves around the country. They're going to be on the docket this uh, winter time for making presentations and, and signing books and things like that. But there's that many more local legends that either are heralded or really don't have much of a reputation outside of your local area that uh, are still active and willing to sit down and have a cup of coffee or a drink and, and talk about fly fishing. So I would encourage you to do that. So once again, I am a big fan of fly fishing history. I think it's great for education, great for conservation, great for entertainment, and that you can do it by picking up a book, by heading to a museum, or I would say the best of all of those things is to have a conversation with a person. Do you have a book? Do you have a museum? Do you have uh, even a story that you would like to share about your uh, interest in the history of fly fishing? Shoot me an email, Matthew at castingacross.com. I'd love to hear about it. Uh, if it's if it's something remarkable, I'll be happy to share it here on the podcast in the coming weeks. This week on castingacross.com, two really interesting articles in my humble opinion. Uh, the first one, uh, which came out on Monday of this week, is called Five Things to Think When Netting Fish. So I talked about fighting fish here on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've seen more people struggle with netting fish, probably than anything else, probably because it's just, it is so dramatic. They're, the fish is flopping around their ankles and they're struggling to grab their net. They're struggling to use their net. They're using their net in the wrong way. They're moving their rod hand as they move their net hand. So they they have a target that's moving on two fronts. So I wrote a couple of very simple, I mean, nothing earth shattering, nothing, you know, uh, revolutionary concepts about uh, how to use a net and things just to think about as you're placing your net and as you are employing your net. And Wednesday's article is called Fly Fishing and Fouling Fall fly fishing and fouling fowl. It's not particularly easy to say, but that's what the article is called. Uh, I had a seagull intercept my fly line. Not my fly. There was no hook involved in this whole thing, but that seagull was flying at quite the clip and it ran straight into my fly line. And there's enough tension on my nine weight fly line that this seagull did not uh, stay airborne. Let's put it that way. So I write about a couple different uh, shorebird experiences and then some experiences with a bat. So if you want to laugh at my misfortune, then hover, head over to castingacross.com and read the article, Fly Fishing and Fouling Fowl. Fly Fishing and Fouling Fowl. This week's recommendation on the podcast is a new book. It's called Fly Tying for Everyone, Learn to Tie Flies with the Latest Patterns that Catch Fish by Tim Camisa. You've heard me mention Tim's name before because I contribute a monthly article to his website and YouTube channel and kind of his his brand, Trout and Feather. Um, some great fly tying tips on there. He takes a good long time to explain the what, the why, and the how of fly tying on his, his website. And he has taken that and he has transformed it into a great hardback book, which just makes me happy to have a nice hardback book. Um, but a good thing about hardback book um, is it lays flat. I'm literally flipping through the pages right now and it's a new book. So no huge creases or anything like that. And it lays flat. A lot of fly tying books use the spiral binding so that they can lay, lay flat. Um, with a hardback book, you really don't have to do that, but a paperback, you, you know, you got paperweights going on, but, um, 
this is great. It is just step by step. I mean, incredibly detailed steps. For something just like a stonefly with a wire rib body, 38 steps with 38 pictures. So you can see things on YouTube and you can see them pretty close up. But if you find yourself stopping and freeze framing things like I do, then this is going to be just as good. So there's quite a few patterns that really cover the the, the you know variety of flies that you're going to be uh, encountering uh, while you're out fishing, and uh, there are the techniques that are explained incredibly uh, well and thoroughly. But again, this is a great book for somebody who is wanting to fill their fly boxes with very efficient flies, and they're wanting to become very proficient themselves at tying them. So this was put out by Stackpole Books, which is um, a, a, a great publishing house, and uh, retails for just under $25. So for a hardback book with some really solid information, excellent photography, uh, if you are a advanced or beginner fly tire, I would suggest it. If you know somebody who's getting into it or somebody who's a tire, I would suggest it. Fly Tying for Everyone by Tim Camisa. I'll put a link to the book in the show notes of this podcast page on castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and leave a rating on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. life that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv in wild country rules were not created by man don't miss wild country wednesdays from 7 to 11 p.m eastern presented by primos speak the language waypoint tv the destination for outdoor entertainment